helped our hearts connect with the Lord this morning. Thank you, Ari, for that gift. I've shared this with some of you of when you've been baptized, that if you go into the baptistry up here and you can see this cross a little closer, I think if I describe it, you'll see it. The man that uh, fashioned this cross was a member of our church and an exquisite woodwork. And so he wanted a cross in the baptistry. So he came one day and said, hey, I want to make a cross for the baptistry. I trusted his word. We talked about it. So that sounded like a good idea. And he made a cross. And then two weeks later, I came in on a Sunday morning, and the cross was gone. And I'm like, if you're going to steal something from the house of God, I don't think Jesus' cross is your best choice, right? But I was shocked. I didn't know what happened. A little while later, Jeff came in. And I didn't want him to be disappointed, so I went up to him and I said, something's happened. The cross is gone. He said, oh, I took it. He said, I came and got it. I took it. I'll bring it back. Okay. He brought it back. He reinstalled it. Then he brought me in here, and he said, here was the problem. When I made it the first time, I sanded it. I polished it. I varnished it. And it was smooth as silk. The opposite of what happened to Jesus. I pulled it off of there. And I took it back to the wood shop and I dented it and I scratched it and I gouged at it. Symbolically, all of the things that happened to Jesus to save my soul. Now it's a better representation of the truth. Some of you I know are thinking about baptism this week. I know it's been on your heart. I hope you'll remember that. I hope you'll take time to look at it. And during the service, I hope you'll take time to reflect on what Jesus chose. And he didn't have to go through it twice, right? He knew it was coming on round one. And he did it for us because he loves us. Let's contemplate on that. Let's pray and then let's go into our lesson. Lord, we're so thankful for the things that we've heard today, the things we've learned today, the things we've confessed and saying, Father, if there are things that are in our heart ready, to, just exploding to get out, then thank you. If there are the questions we have, if we wonder if we love, if we wonder if we have a future with you, if we wonder if we can be forgiven, then I pray in these moments as we look at that old rugged cross that we'll know you've made your decision. That there is forgiveness, there is redemption, there is a future. You've made your decision. And now you're welcoming us to join you in that decision. The decision for us by you. And so, Father, we pray as we open your word that we'll open our hearts and hear your word this morning. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So before we move on, I want to say a couple things. First of all, I want to say thank you to Isaiah and Mike. Now, if you weren't here, amen. amen. If you were here at the beginning of service, these are two of our youth interns for the summer. And they're, they're, they've, they've been here before, so we know them. Maya's a, a grown up here. And, uh, but the truth is, I did drive to Upstate University to watch her play. And uh, I'm not bashful when I'm in those situations. And uh, I was, man, I was so excited. And I'm yelling and I'm, you know, encouraging because she's the best player on the floor. Of course I want her to shoot, you know. And, and we were down. So you get the logic, right? But then I get a text from one of my elders, Fernando over here. And he says, are you at the game? They were, they were broadcasting that game on ESPN3. <laughs> and he watched me and said, are you in the stands? Yes. <laughs> and then I put it together. Man. Well, at least they know we love us some Maya Timberman, right? Right? Amen. And then uh, it's been such a blessing this summer. Isaiah has been living with us this summer uh, with Susan and I. And uh, so he has immersed himself in our family, blessed us immeasurably. And I don't think it's going to go well when he leaves because he's going to have a little, uh, some broken arts at our house. But it has been wonderful. Also, last Sunday morning, 
I, we were sitting here in church, and some of you were wondering why Susan and I were on our phones. And that's because our son and daughter-in-law were at the hospital, and they were having a baby. And so we were waiting for checkups during worship. This was happening last Sunday morning. So baby, uh, granddaughter number four arrived during church last Sunday morning. Her name is Lily Taylor. So that's a new baby, right? Lily Taylor McLaughlin. Now, here's what happened. So Susan and I, my wife and I, Susan, raise your hands so everybody knows uh, I'm married mild mountains above my head. So Susan and I had the two oldest granddaughters, Mila, who will be eight in a few weeks, and Nora, who will be four in a few months. So on Wednesday, because of COVID, we couldn't go to the hospital and all that. So on Wednesday, we took them to meet their baby sister in person, right? So we go over to Aaron and Aaron's house, and they walk in, and they do the whole thing, and we may have a picture or two of all of that. And uh, so in we go. Well, then we get out in the car an hour and a half later, and we're driving home. Now, Mila, the one that's turning eight, has been through this before. So on the way home, she said, there's a lot of sharing and a lot of changes in the future. <laughs> Her four-year-old little sister said, no, there's not. I am in charge. <laughs> I thought, yeah, we'll see about that, right? But what about the future? If you are, if this is your first time with us today, or uh, it's the first time back in a while, thank you for coming. We're in a series looking at a book in the Bible called Joel. So this is in the first part of your Bible. We call it the Old Testament. It's the book of Joel. It's three chapters long. The story happens about 2,700 years ago. People are like, well, why would you study something so long ago? Let me give you this. The Bible says the day of the Lord is like a 1,000 years. A 1,000 years is like a day. So 27 years ago, 100 years ago, ain't even three days ago, right? So it's current, it's right now, but here's why we chose that. Because as we prayed and the Holy Spirit gave us direction, you opened to Joel chapter 1 and verse 2, and here is the opening question. Has anything like this ever happened before? They are coming out of a calamity. Their calamity was a locust plague. So here they were, their orchards were full of fruit, their fields were full of grain, their vineyards were full of grapes, their coffers were full of finances, their economics were strong, the house of the Lord was blessed, and in a moment, described like an army, the locusts descended on them and destroyed everything. In a matter of hours, hours, it was destroyed. Locusts can travel up to 90 miles in a day, averaging around 40 to 60 miles in a day. They never saw it coming. They might have thought it was a dust cloud. They might have thought it was a rain cloud. They didn't know, but when it came, they describe it like armies and chariots and horses that just crawl, never breaking ranks, over the windows, a three into the house, over the walls, and they destroyed everything. And when it was over, the grain was gone, the orchards were stripped bare, no grapes, no finances, everything was destroyed, all the way from the, from the house of government to the house of the Lord to their own home. And the people are shocked. What has happened? And it takes a while to dawn on them that what's happened didn't just feel tomorrow. It's not like they're just worried about tomorrow, like what will we eat tomorrow? Because in Joel, it even says that the seeds that were in the ground also shriveled up. It says that there was a drought. Everything is destroyed. And it's telling because as it talks about everything that was withered, it says even their joy, even their joy withered away. The people are in mourning and lament. They are devastated and they don't know what to do. But Joel chapter 1 and verse 3, God says you need to figure out how to tell the story. Future generations, like the songs we sang this morning, future generations need to know what did you do? What did you do when you faced calamity? What did you do? Because the truth is, as we're looking back on calamity 2,700 years ago, somebody's going to be looking back on ours. 
They're going to want to know, what did you do? We talk, we hear this on the news, we hear it on podcasts, that this calamity, this COVID pandemic is a once in a century pandemic. Well, of course it is, because the last worldwide pandemic that was anything like this was 1918, 1919. But just as we probably falsely imagined for the last hundred years that it would never happen again, so something like it will happen in the future. And people are going to want to know, what do you do? What was it like? When did you finally get your legs under you again? How did you emerge from isolation, from depression, from heartache? How did you emerge from loss? How did you emerge from grieving? Did the sun ever kind of shine again? I don't mean the sun outside. I mean in your heart. Did you ever feel normal again? This is why we're studying this theme, Emerge, and that's why we're looking to God for guidance. We are at the eighth and final lesson in the series. Look with me, if you would, at Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3. And if you've missed some lessons along the way, go to lovefirst.org. Click on the sermons. You can go back and review the ones that we've covered in this study so far. In Joel chapter 3, God says, let me, let me cover two final themes. The final theme that he opened up earlier is, there is a coming day of the Lord. The two final themes are that that day of the Lord could be a day of restoration and blessing for you, or it could be a day of destruction and despair. It can be of a day of accountability only where you're just in trouble, or it can be a day of opportunity that no matter what you've been through, there's a new future open for you. But God says, see, I've made my decision. So if you hear the Jeopardy theme, I'm waiting on you. I want to know what you'll decide. Will it be only accountability? Chapter 1 and chapter 2, God says, hey, by the way, I'm not saying that your sin made the plague. I'm saying your sin complicated the effects of the plague. How many of us could admit right now that our personal sin during the pandemic may have complicated things a little bit for us? Oh, come on. Ain't no time to be smug. We're in the middle of a pandemic and we want to be out of it, right? So this is no time to be smug. The truth is that no matter how this pandemic descended on the world, the decisions we've made during the pandemic have not been batting a thousand. We've had off and on moments. How many of you can look back at a conversation where you did well? How many of you can look back on when that you hope people will let fade from their memory? Come on. You know the truth. Some of us, sadly, one of the great sins of the pandemic is our arrogance. So it's hard for us to admit that our conversations have been damaging to someone else. Others of us think that that's the only thing is that our life is just such turmoil that the only thing about us is bad. And God says, well, let me clarify something. I'm in you. You are my child. You are an image bearer. You are worth it. And you are loved. No matter how many problems you've had, no matter how many difficulties and how many failures, God says, you are loved, you are mine, I want you to live like it. Right? But you see, if you've been, you know, spending a lot of good time pointing your fingers at those who aren't doing well, God might suggest that you pull that finger back a little bit, because Jesus had a story about that. That's like trying to dig a speck out of somebody else's eye when you got a baseball bat in your own. He said, let's let go of that. Drop that arrogance and just cry out to me, is what he said in Joel. Let your disorientation be reoriented, not in an echo chamber of people who already agree with your views, but in direct communication with God, who has the only perfect view of what has happened, happening and what will happen. So how do we move forward? Joel chapter 3, verse 17. God says, Then you will know, when he speaks of the restoration of his people, that I, 
The Lord your God dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again were foreign invaders or foreigners invade her. A fountain, excuse me. In that day, the mountains will drip new wine. The hills will flow with milk, and the ravines of Judah will run with water. Stop and look at that again. God says, what do you see right now? Scorched earth. In the mountains that used to be covered with fruit, what do you see? Scorched earth. The valleys that were the vineyards were full, what do you see? Scorched earth. God said, let me tell you what's coming. Turn back on the set, let me show you what comes next. Mountaintops drip with new wine. Hills flow with milk. Ravines of Judah will run with water. And a fountain will flow out of the Lord's house. And will water the valley of Acacias. Now that's good news. He said, but let me also say something. For Egypt, they will be desolate. Edom, a desert waste. Whoa. And these aren't the only neighbors of Israel that are in trouble. Why are they in trouble? Because of the violence done to the people of Judah in whose land they shed innocent blood. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. But shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. God said, let me clarify something for you. Earlier in Joel, he said to his own people, I don't play favorites. If you live like a heathen, if you treat people with injustice, don't put your little badge on that says, hey, I'm the people of God, and think that you are going to evade judgment. But then he says to Israel's neighbors, who think it's just normal if a neighboring nation is down, kick them while they're down. He said, well, when you did that, I was watching. And you will now be called into account. Whoa. So let me get this straight, God. Let me understand that no matter who you are, you will face accountability and opportunity. God says, you got it right. So for the person with some experience, they might come away from Joel and say, there are going to be some changes around here. And for the one without experience, no, there won't. I'm in charge. Let's hope that the pandemic has given us enough experience to understand we're not in charge. God is in charge and God will redeem. So I want to close our message with three ways to approach the future. And here they are. First, you are loved. God, through the cross, has demonstrated that he could not stand the thought of heaven without you. And pulled out all the stops to redeem you. You are loved. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Before sin. You realize they didn't have to prepare to meet God because they didn't know anything different. They had always walked with God. They had always enjoyed fellowship with God. No one had to say, prepare to meet God. Why? Because there's no struggle. There's no barrier between us and God. The Bible says at the end of Genesis chapter 2 that they were naked and not ashamed. What do we mean naked? Transparent, known before God. God knew everything and they had no reason to fear. After sin, the Bible says that they were hiding. And the reason they were hiding is because they realized they were naked and they were ashamed. Adam and Eve did not have to fear God, but they didn't know it. And after sin... All they could feel was fearing God. I don't mean the fear of the Lord that means reverence. I mean they were scared of God. Satan had done his work. The one that could actually help them is the one they were now afraid of. You are loved. You are cherished by God. Approach the future that way. That's one option. A second option is you're in trouble. These nations, the worst part about it is they're in trouble, but they don't think they are. The worst part about it is they've sinned, but they don't believe it. So what does God say? You need to prepare to meet me. Really? Yes, you do. Because you're in bigger trouble than you know. 
prepare to meet God. But then there's a third approach. You ready? You used to be in trouble, but you're not anymore. What this means is it's an honest acknowledgement that my life includes all the history of every mistake I've ever made, public and private. Every mistake everyone knows about and does not know about. Every evil thought, every evil word muttered, God knows it all. God knows it better than I do. And God says, you understand, you used to be in trouble but not anymore. Wherever the blood of Jesus has been applied, you, though your sins were as scarlet, have been washed white as snow. Though your righteousness, false as it was, it is filthy rags compared to your righteousness in Jesus Christ. You go before the judgment seat of Christ, you stand in there in front of God, and Jesus says, just a second, just a second, and he steps in right in front of you, and God says, who's on trial today? Jesus says, I am for them. You were in trouble, but you are not in trouble anymore. You see, the reality is you've been redeemed. Just because the past didn't turn out like you wanted it to doesn't mean that your future can't be better than you ever imagined. But the onus is on us. If you want a better future, you will have to choose a better future. I thought about a little post-it note, a little prayer that might go something like this. Dear past, thank you for all the lessons. Dear future, with God's help, I am now ready. Jesus teaches us that whatever happened in the past, whatever we think is happening in the present, or whatever we imagined in the future, all of it is banked on eternity. God is the world's future. God is your future. And God says, listen, you are loved. And if you're in trouble right now, why don't you advance to the third stage where you used to be in trouble, but not anymore. I'm going to invite our praise team to come and join us right now. And we're going to sing a couple of songs together, but these are songs of contemplation They're songs of celebration, but they're songs of contemplation. They're songs intended to get us to start thinking, what will I do next? What steps will I take? Am I going to live the rest of my life moving into the future just in trouble? Or am I ready to accept that I'm loved and that there's a new future for me because of the power and love of God?